military official who posted secrets online about the war in Ukraine and our allies. It was a 21-year-old airman. Investigators are still down the street surrounding his home, and that has neighbors here on edge. A morning exchange of gunfire stunned a West Little Rock neighborhood, and we're still working to get answers about what exactly happened. The right of the citizens to keep and bear arms has justly been considered as the palladium of the liberties of a republic. On the Massachusetts guardsmen accused of leaking classified documents online. Today, the Justice Department arrested Jack Douglas Teixeira in connection with an investigation. Massachusetts Guard member charged. In a recent development, Jack Teixeira, a 21-year-old member of the Massachusetts Air National Guard, has been charged with two counts related to retaining and distributing classified and national defense information. Currently detained in Boston, Teixeira's case has garnered attention for several reasons. Firstly, the charges against Texera are uncommon, even within the realm of leak cases. Given the sensitive nature of classified information, such cases often attract significant scrutiny and attention from both government officials and the public. Secondly, amid condemnation from top Republicans in Congress regarding the leaks, a notable far-right lawmaker has emerged to defend Texera. This divergent stance from a prominent political figure adds complexity to an already contentious situation. Thirdly, Texera's role in the National Guard is significant. It's customary for individuals in such positions, including Texera, to hold top-secret clearance due to the sensitive nature of their work. Today, the Justice Department arrested Jack Douglas Teixeira in connection with an investigation. On the Massachusetts guardsmen accused of leaking classified documents online. The suspect will be charged with unauthorized removal of classified national defense information. Terry official who posted secrets online about the war in Ukraine and our allies. It was a 21 year old airman. Charging documents suggest that Texera was fully aware of the potential consequences of his actions, indicating a premeditated decision to retain and distribute classified information. In a separate incident, federal agents allegedly conducted surveillance on a Massachusetts man's online arm purchase history, resulting in a raid on his home and the confiscation of his arms. Notably, there were no specific accusations of criminal activity against the individual. Despite lacking a criminal record or any evidence of violent behavior, he now faces a staggering 46 arm-related charges including possession of mags and arms prohibited by state law. Compounding the severity of the situation, he is being detained without bond. This case raises significant concerns regarding civil liberties, due process, and the delicate balance between security measures and individual rights. It underscores the importance of ensuring that law enforcement actions are justified, proportionate, and respectful of fundamental rights, even in the pursuit of national security objectives into alleged unauthorized removal, retention, and transmission of classified national defense information. Moments ago, a large presence of multiple law enforcement agencies were seen outside of a home in... Di Investigators are still down the street surrounding his home, and that has neighbors here on edge. And Jack Teixeira's ability to access and allegedly share protected intel has really rattled the intelligence community. Brian Malinowski shooting and its aftermath. The tragic events surrounding Brian Malinowski's demise at the hands of federal agents in a shootout have sent shockwaves through Little Rock, Arkansas, and beyond. Unsealed search warrant records shed light on the circumstances leading up to the fatal encounter, revealing an investigation into Malinowski's alleged involvement in the sale of arms without a license. As an executive director of the Bill and Hillary Clinton National Airport, Malinowski's role in the community was significant. However, the affidavit filed by the ATF agent suggests a darker side to his activities. According to the affidavit, the investigation began in November, triggered by a photo of arms received by Canadian authorities from a confidential informant. The serial numbers on the weapons implicated Malinowski as the purchaser. The document outlines a pattern of behavior wherein Malinowski allegedly acquired over 150 arms between May 2021 and February 2022, subsequently selling them, including at arm shows. Several of these arms were later implicated in criminal activities, with six being recovered at crime scenes and three sold to undercover ATF agents. Notably, one arm purchased by Malinowski was found in the possession of a 15-year-old Nortino gang member in California. 
the unfolding of events on the morning of the fatal encounter paints a tense picture. ATF agents arrived at Malinowski's residence to serve a search warrant, only to be met with arm fire. Malinowski allegedly opened fire on the agents, resulting in an exchange of bullets that left him critically wounded. Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms and Explosives arrived at Brian Melanowski's home on Tuesday. Executive Director of the Little Rock Airport, a redacted affidavit now revealing the ATF was investigating. The morning exchange of gunfire stunned a West Little Rock neighborhood and we're still working to get answers about what exactly happened. They portrayed Malinowski as an arm enthusiast engaged in private sales, challenging the severity of the ATF's response. The search warrant affidavit provides insight into Malinowski's arm transactions, detailing his purported acquisition of arms through online orders and at arm shows. Allegations suggest that Malinowski operated as a vendor at these events, selling arms without the required paperwork or identification. The affidavit further alleges that Malinowski made false statements regarding the intended recipients of the arms on ATF forms. Amidst the unfolding tragedy, Malinowski's family called for patience, urging the public and the media to await the full disclosure of facts. They emphasized the need for privacy as they grappled with the loss of their loved one. The search warrant receipt, listing an array of arms, ammunition, financial documents and other items seized from Malinowski's residence, underscores the gravity of the investigation. The inclusion of tax returns and vendor tags suggests a meticulous examination of Malinowski's activities beyond the realm of arms sales. As the community mourns the loss of a respected figure and grapples with the implications of the ATF's actions, unanswered questions linger. The unsealed records offer a glimpse into the complexities surrounding Malinowski's life and the events leading up to his tragic demise. In the pursuit of justice and transparency, the full truth behind the fatal encounter must come to light, providing closure for all those affected by this devastating incident. Agents from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and Explosives served a federal search warrant. Brian Melanowski, after guns and separate crimes across the country were traced back to him. Brian Mal Malowski fired an ATF agent and they returned fire. Arm control debate in America. In recent years, the debate surrounding arm control in the U.S. has intensified, fueled by a series of tragic mass slayings and a polarized political landscape. With each incident, calls for stricter arm laws clash with arguments for protecting Second Amendment rights, creating a complex and contentious issue that remains unresolved at the national level. The U.S. has a long history of arm ownership, rooted in its founding principles and enshrined in the Second Amendment of the Constitution. This amendment, which guarantees the right of citizens to keep and bear arms, has been interpreted in various ways over the years, leading to differing views on the extent of arm rights and the role of government in regulating arms. On one side of the debate are arm control advocates who argue for measures to restrict access to arms in order to reduce arm crime and enhance public safety. These measures often include background checks for arm purchases, restrictions on certain types of arms such as attack weapons, and requirements for safe storage and training. Proponents of arm control point to statistics showing high rates of arm-related demises and injuries in the U.S compared to other developed countries, and they advocate for policies aimed at addressing this public health crisis. On the other side are arm rights advocates, who view the Second Amendment as a fundamental right that should be protected from government interference. They argue that arm ownership is essential for self-defense, hunting, and as a safeguard against tyranny. Arm rights supporters often resist any attempts to impose restrictions on arms, warning that such measures could infringe on individual liberties and lead to a slippery slope of government overreach. They also emphasize the role of responsible arm ownership and argue that the focus should be on enforcing existing laws rather than enacting new ones. The debate over arm control is not confined to the national level. It also plays out at the state and local levels where policymakers have the authority to enact their own arm laws. This has led to a patchwork of regulations across the country with some states adopting strict arm control measures while others prioritize arm rights. The divide between states with more restrictive arm laws, such as California and New York, and those with more permissive laws, such as Texas and Arizona, reflects the broader ideological and political differences within the country. One significant factor shaping the arm control debate is the influence of interest groups, particularly the National Rifle Association 
which is one of the most powerful lobbying organizations in the U.S. In recent years, the issue of arm control has gained renewed urgency in the wake of several high-profile mass slayings, including incidents at schools, churches, and concerts. These tragedies have sparked nationwide protests, calls for legislative action, and debates over the root causes of armed crime in America. Involving peeping people who made simple mistakes, just doing stuff we do every single day. You may feel like there's a mass shooting in the U.S. every time you look at the news. The right of the citizens to keep and bear arms has justly been considered as the palladium of the liberties of a republic. And so alone that they would resort to violence this regularly and this casually. While there is broad consensus on the need to prevent such atrocities from occurring, there is often disagreement on the most effective solutions, with armed control advocates pushing for stricter regulations and armed rights advocates emphasizing the importance of mental health care, law enforcement, and individual responsibility. The debate over armed control is further complicated by constitutional considerations, legal precedent, and cultural attitudes toward arms. The interpretation of the Second Amendment has evolved over time, with courts weighing the individual right to bear arms against the government's interest in regulating arms. Supreme Court rulings such as District of Columbia v. Heller and McDonald v. City of Chicago have affirmed the individual right to own arms for self-defense, but they have also upheld certain restrictions on arm ownership, such as bans on felons and the mentally ill from possessing arms. Despite these legal precedents, the issue of arm control remains highly politicized, with lawmakers often hesitant to take action due to concerns about alienating their constituents or facing backlash from interest groups. This has led to legislative gridlock at the federal level, with many proposed armed control measures failing to gain traction in Congress. As a result, states have taken the lead in enacting their own arm laws, leading to a patchwork of regulations that vary widely from state to state. That's all for this video, folks. See you next time.